Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us today for our Ask an Angler covering bank fishing for non-game species here in Oklahoma. So kind of go through some of the non-game species that you're likely to catch, um, where you might look to find them and what types of baits and lure you would look to use as well as your rod, reel and line setup. The cool thing about non-game species here in the state is that typically our non-game species are much larger in size than the traditional sought after game species. So big game species like your bass and catfish, walleye, sawgye, trout, temperate bass species like white bass, hybrid striped bass and striped bass. A big fish for them is going to start around kind of that four pound mark, um, really anything over four pounds for those traditional game fish or big fish. Um, but the average size fish that you catch typically is going to be somewhere in that half pound up to four pound range. So with our non-game species, most of them, you're going to kind of average catching fish that are going to start around four pounds and go all the way up into the 20s, 30s, 40s, you know, even 50 pounds, especially with some of the bigger, longer lived species like our buffalo and carp. Um, so few of the non-game species that you're most likely to run into, um, you've probably caught incidentally fishing for game species. Number one fish is going to be drum. So our freshwater drum that we have here in Oklahoma, uh, they're very similar in stature kind of to like a largemouth bass, uh, the way that they're built, they kind of have a hump on their head and they kind of fan out uh, to their tail fin, but they are a pretty good predator. Um, they are a fish eating fish. So lots of people catch drum, especially at this time of year from the bank when they're crappie fishing or white bass fishing or bass fishing using little small baby shads, hair jigs, swim baits, things like that, that are in the three inch and undersize. So drum are probably the most caught um, of the non-game species, even for people who are not actively targeting those fish. Your other big ones that you're going to have are going to be your carp species. So in Oklahoma, we have a few different species of carp, but the most prevalent are going to be the common carp, as well as our grass carp. Common carp, do not typically get as big as grass carp can. Grass carp, uh, a lot of them are bred as uh, what are called triploids. So they're engineered to not reproduce. So they just spend all of their time, uh, effort and energy eating, and they are a longer length fish. So uh, they can attain some pretty great weights. I believe the state record is somewhere in the 70s, um, but lots of grass carp get caught or shot with bows and arrows in the uh, kind of 30 to 50 pound range. Uh, your next species are going to be your buffalo species, um, your small mouth and your big mouth buffalo. Those are going to be some long lived, very big fish. Um, some people specialize in catching them, but again, most of your non game species that you end up encountering in Oklahoma when you're fishing is typically incidental catch. When you're fishing with bait for catfish or crappie, something like that, you end up you know, catching these non-game species, but they're fun. And there's certain areas around the state where you can just target those species. And on average, they're going to be some of the bigger fish that you're going to be able to catch out of that water body. So the added incentive for those who like to trophy fish for large uh, weights, non-game definitely will get you there quicker than trying to go and catch like a monster catfish or something like that. Um, nether species that are pretty well sought after um, for bow fishermen, especially uh, a lot of incidental catch are going to be your gar species. So in Oklahoma, we have four species of gar, long nose being the most common, then our short nose gar, uh, our spotted gar, which is one of the more rare, uh, you don't see a lot of spotted gar, um, and then the alligator gar, which are in the Red River system. So they're kind of confined to a, a small area. But um, of all the fish that are in the state, alligator gar, um, have the greatest growth potential. So they are the largest freshwater fish that we have here in Oklahoma. The um, current state record, I believe, is in the mid to high 200s, um, but they certainly have the ability to grow to 300 pounds. So that is a pretty substantial fish. They're heavily targeted down in Texas, especially on the Trinity River system. Um, but we'll kind of discuss the pros and cons of, of gar fishing and how you go after them uh, due to like hooking and mortality rates. Um, 
And then you're going to end up with, um, you know, a lot of different river sucker species, your river red horse, your carp suckers, um, lots of different neat type of um, micro species that you'll find in our clear water stream. So with that, we'll kind of uh, get into what you're going to look for as far as like your rod and reel setup is going to be concerned. So because you are targeting bigger fish on average, you probably want to be starting off with at least a medium action rod all the way up to a medium heavy or heavy action rod. As far as reels are concerned, it's really whatever you're comfortable with. You can use a spinning reel, you can use a casting reel, or you can use a spin casting reel. Um, and then as far as line goes, that's where you really, the, the line and hook sizes are where you really start to tailor down to what you're targeting, where you're targeting, how you're targeting. Um, but 10 pound test is probably a good starting point just because you are more apt to get into fish that are going to be five plus pounds. So having enough line strength uh, to pair, but you could go all the way up to 30, 40, 50 pounds, especially if you're getting really specialized with larger rods, maybe surf rods, um, really big catfish rods, and specifically targeting large fish. I mean, fish that are going to be over 30 pounds. Um, and then you might want to, you know, tailor your equipment accordingly with your line, but nice medium, medium, heavy action rod, 10, 12 pound test somewhere in there. You're going to be able to hold on to the majority of the fish that you end up hooking up. Um, so as far as like braided line, fluorocarbon line, monofilament line, monofilament line is going to be fine. Um, you're, probably going to be fishing down near the bottom most of the time. So uh, monofilament's a good line to use. It's going to have a pretty good abrasion resistance to like rocks and wood or lay downs, things that you might encounter either uh, casting and retrieving, or uh, if you're letting bait soak, once you actually hook up into a fish, these big fish are going to fight you down towards the bottom. So they're going to be running your line across and through lots of things that can cause abrasion. And so Anytime you're fishing your rocks, braid is not going to be a good bet because it braid frays very easily, even the heavier pound test when it comes in contact with rock and fluorocarbon. It just is not nearly as abrasion resistant as monofilament and it's a lot more expensive. So you're better off just going with, you know, cheap to medium, you know, priced monofilament line, 10 pound, like trilene big game is what we use for a lot of our, um, fishing clinics that we put on just medium action rods and those hold up pretty well with bigger fish. So we'll kind of go through the different species. Um, we'll, we'll kind of single out a few of the major ones that you're likely to run into in most of the bodies of water here in Oklahoma. There are going to be places that you can go to, especially like clear water streams over in the Eastern half of the state where you're likely to get into a more diverse array of fish species that you can catch. We'll touch on that a little bit, but we're going to focus mainly on kind of our big three or four non-game species, which are going to be drum, carp, gar, and um, our buffalo. And so we'll start off with gar. So gar can be found in pretty much every body of water in the state outside of like farm ponds and even some farm ponds that are susceptible to flooding or in a floodplain end up with gar in them over time. Um, but gar are really well suited for our prairie streams here in Oklahoma. And they're, they're pretty well adaptable. They, we find them in lots of different types of habitat. Uh, gar's range across the country um, is they're, they're a warm water fish. So you're going to find them in your Southern states, but ranging in lots of different types of water from Florida all the way over here to Oklahoma. So they're going to live in clear water. They're going to live in turbid water. They're going to live in spring fed rivers. They're going to live in muddy prairie runoff type creeks. So very well adapted. And what you're going to run into most of the time is going to be long nose gar. Long nose gar on average are going to be somewhere between about two and four feet long. Um, it's hard to judge them in weight because they attain these great lengths. So the way that they carry their weight is more like a cylindrical kind of stays even throughout the course of their body from right where at the base of their um, tail fin all the way up to their snout. They stay pretty consistent as far as their circumference goes where a lot of other fish are going to be uniquely shaped throughout the course of their body. Um, so as they get longer, they kind of gain weight appropriately with that. But there's obviously instances where fish can gorge themselves in bait rich environments and gain a little bit, you know, a four foot gar in one river system could be 
few pounds heavier, a few pounds lighter, just depending on what it's eating of a gar of the same length in another body of water. But once you start to kind of get into that two to four foot range, you're going to be averaging fish that are going to be somewhere between probably four and 10 pounds, um, somewhere in there, just depending on what they're eating. Now, as they start to get over four foot, you start getting your five and six footers. Then you start seeing gar top in 20 pounds, um, anywhere from 20 to 40 pounds is where those four to six foot fish are going to be. And those are your really trophy fish. Your spotted gar and short nose gar are, you know, they're not going to attain those types of lengths or weights. They're going to top out around like three to four feet and typically top out, you know, somewhere around 10 pounds as far as what they can grow to. And then your alligator gar can grow to eight, nine feet and can be, uh, you know, three, 400 pounds if allowed to live their entire life in a stress-free and bait heavy environment. Um, but the unique thing about gar is that they have these teeth in their beaks. So each, uh, gar species mouth and is a little bit different. They're shaped a little bit different. Your alligator gar is more of a big triangle. So when they surface on top, just like the name implies, when they've been seen in the southern waters, especially where there's alligators, they're oftentimes misidentified as alligators. And so name alligator gar, very fitting for them. Short nose gar have very similar noses, except they are much smaller, but it's still more of a broad triangular shape. Your spotted and your long nose gar are going to have more of a needle type nose. It's going to be very, you know, kind of like your two fingers together going out to a point. So not very wide, but every single one of those gar species has um, these very needle sharp teeth um, and very bony, hard mouths. So they're very difficult to catch with traditional hooks. So whether you're using bait or whether you're using um, artificial lures, you're not likely to get a good, true in the mouth hook set just because of the way their mouths are shaped. So that leaves you with two options of how you're going to target gar. Um, the way that is going to be best for the fish and fun for you as the angler is going to be using what are called rope lures. And so a rope lure is just like, it's, just like the name implies. It's a piece of nylon rope that's been unwound and then uh, braided out with like a wire brush. And so you can make your own. So these are, this is one that I made. So all you need to make a rope lure is just a medium to large size barrel swivel. Just a cheap pack and go to the dollar store, dollar general, Walmart, somewhere cheap and get some, you know, white, cheap nylon rope. And then you just take it out of the package, take some uh, shears or something that you can cut through that nylon rope with. It's probably going to take something more than your kitchen scissors. Um, but once you cut a, cut an end off, you're going to be able to unwind all of those strands and you're just going to take them down until you get to the thinnest strands that are wound up. And then you'll lay them down on a hard surface like, um, you know, concrete's great. Or if you got a shop table uh, that you can run your wire brush and you just take a wire brush and you lay it down flat, you could clamp them to something so you're not holding it with your fingers and then you're just going to keep working that wire brush through that nylon rope until it gets nice and feathered out and kind of looks like the same material that you might see on like a big clouser minnow or like a really good fleshy fly. Um, then you can get like ripple flash fly tying material, something like that, just to give it a little bit extra. So when it's going through the water, you get our nice little bait fish right here. And then you pull your rope once you're done through one side of that barrel swivel's eye, pull it down and then cinch it tight with the zip tie and then cut the tag end off of the zip tie and then cut the rest of the tag of the rope that you pulled through, leaving a little bit for the pull. Um, if you don't get it secured enough or you cut off too much of the tag, what will end up happening is if you can pull it as hard as you can and it doesn't come out, perfect. But if it starts to move a little bit, you probably wanna cut that zip tie up and then re-zip tie it to make sure you're nice and secure. But the great thing about these is you basically fish in Texas rig. So it's got no weight. This doesn't weigh anything. It's just a piece of rope. So the only weight on it is the barrel swivel. So what you'd be looking to use is taking like a bullet weight 
and just putting a bullet weight on your main line before you tie your main line to the other eye hole of the barrel swivel. And then you're just going to cast them out into areas that have gar. So if you have access to any streams, um, I live here in central Oklahoma, so I fish on the Cimarron River a lot. Um, there's access points in Guthrie, Ripley, Oilton, um, lots of right of ways through some of the smaller towns that uh, the Cimarron runs through. So same thing goes for the Washita, the Canadians, uh, Deep Fork, anywhere we can get on one of the prairie streams in Oklahoma, you're more than likely going to run into a bunch of long nose gar, especially as we get into the summer months. So those gar are going to be looking to spawn um, in water temperatures are, that are much warmer than the traditional game species that are going through their spawning cycles right now. They're more gar are more in line with kind of the catfish species. Um, so they're going to spawn kind of in that May to June range, and they'll use little feeder creeks to go up. Um, a really good spot for gar fishing is just north of Guthrie on the Cimarron, and there's a right-of-way where you can get down onto the river right uh, just, believe it's whichever way that river's flowing going that way. So just downstream of um, Skeleton Creek. And those gar use Skeleton Creek as their spawning grounds. And so you will have thousands of gar that will push up that little run right there uh, off of Highway 77, just north of Guthrie, before they make the turn to go up Skeleton Creek. So with these, all you're doing when you're casting in rivers is basically just casting cross current, maybe a little bit upstream with a bullet weight, probably a quarter ounce bullet weight is plenty, maybe an eighth of an ounce. Um, if you're in super, super heavy flow, um, you know, you you might not have a lot of success catching those fish when that water is moving super fast. You kind of try to get them when we're at normal or low flow. They're easier to target that way on the rivers. But you're just going to cast it out and straight retrieve it like you would a swim bait or anything else. And the great thing about these rope lures is when a gar comes and gets it, this nylon in their teeth, it gets stuck. So they can't get out. So you're in the perfect situation because all their teeth are locked up on your rope. And then your line with your swivel is away from their mouth. So you're not likely to get abrasion as far as um, their teeth nicking your line and snapping your line, which will happen if you get like a hook or a lure that gets back in their mouth and you're tied on with monofilament or braid or fluorocarbon. If you're not using a wire leader, more than likely, unless you're using some super, super heavy monofilament line, like 60 plus pound monofilament line as a leader, they're going to be able to fray and snap that. So with these, they grab onto it, can't get away. And the great thing about it is, is when you make a lure, so you can buy rope lures or gar lures. Sometimes you'll find them in, you know, local ma and pa bait shops around the country. Um, but typically you just make your own. It's real cheap, super easy deal. It's way easier than like tying flies. There's not a lot of steps. Um, but when you're working that wire brush and trying to get it all frayed out and, uh, you know, make it look nice and pretty, that can take some time with that wire brush. So when you get it close, the great thing about when you start catching fish is once those fish start hitting it, they really start to fray it for you. And it makes your lure just get better and better until it starts to look like this after it's caught a few fish. Um, but gar are awesome. Uh, gar, I call gar freshwater tarpon. Uh, when you shoot them with a bow and arrow, not a whole lot of fun because there's no fight to the fish with the arrow you're basically shooting through, you know, especially if you hit a mid body, they don't have a whole lot to be able to work with. Um, they're streamlined. They're meant to be able to go up and down the river super easy because they're not taking a bunch of current because they're streamlined built. But when you hook them in the mouth, what they tend to do is they'll go airborne on you and gar, you know, especially big long guards, pretty cool to see these huge long fish that don't weigh too much. You know, they're going to average somewhere in that four to 10 pound range. So enough to give you a good double over on a medium action, medium heavy rod, but they'll tail walk. They'll go up and down the river and they cannot get out of these ropes. The two things that you do need though, that you have to have when you're fishing with something like this for gar is you want to make sure that you've got a good set of pliers and gloves. Um, gar scales are just as dangerous as their teeth. So they have rear facing uh, scale plates. So on the back points of every single scale is essentially a knife edge. And if you grab onto a gar and it slips backwards in your hand, I mean, it's like running a cheese grater across your hand. So having gloves, having pliers, 
That way you can hold on to that fish with the glove, rubber gloves, like rubber fishing gloves, at least rubber on the bottom, on the palm side. And then you can get their mouth open and get the pliers in there and just kind of work the rope lure out. Now, the other way that people target gar, which is probably the way that most people end up catching gar, is using bait. So whether you're using a live minnow or whether you're using cut shad, so let's say you're fishing for catfish or something like that, a lot of times you'll get incidental gar catches. The problem with catching gar or any species for that matter, but especially gar is when you use hooks, any type of terminal tackle, because those fish, you, you almost, you really don't have much of a chance of hooking them in the mouth. So you have to allow that fish to swallow the bait. So that takes time. So a lot of people, they'll fish for them with bobbers. That way they can see the bobber start to move up river or move down river when that fish takes the bait and you let them have it for a minute or two minutes because they're just going to keep working it down into their gullet. And once you've given them enough time, you go and set the hook. So what people end up doing is you reel them in, you cut your line. Like most people are told hook will rust out, you know, cut the line. Well, that's true when people are hooking bass and stuff in the gullet, there's still a pretty high mortality rate, but you can get some rust out. The problem with gar they get that hook in and then they swallow the hook and that hook, even the small hooks, there are studies that have been done with gar using all different sizes of circle hooks and having them swallow it. And the mortality rate of those fish is in the nineties. So that is, you're letting a fish swim away. That's ultimately going to die. Um, so there's kind of, uh, you know, the great debate that goes on right now within fisheries um, of different states who manage, you know, especially like alligator gar that are a threatened species. When people are going out there targeting these monster trophy fish, it's great. It's fun for the angler. They're, you know, it creates ecotourism with guide services and everything like that. Um, but what ends up happening is they're catching and releasing 5, 10, 20 fish in a day. And almost all those fish are going to die as a result of angling. Um, so that's, that is kind of the downfall of the gar. Now, gar are delicious. Um, long nose gar, they have basically like tubular back straps that run down the entire length of their body. They are just incredibly difficult to cut open. Um, there's different methods of how you can get into them, but you're not going to get into them with the traditional fillet knife or even an electric fillet knife. So lots of people who eat gar, um, because they are a white fish. So they have nice, good, firm texture. Gar pretty much eat only fish. So they're a good tasting, nice, white, flaky meat that you can get off of them. Some people will go in with like a sawzall and they'll take a sawzall right down the spine to open them up. Or somebody will take tin snips and you'll snip down along so you can fold those um, plates back, those scale plates to get in so that you can uh, extract the meat from the uh, backbone. But you can YouTube videos, how to clean gar, and I'm sure there's plenty of educational videos and some that are probably pretty funny as well for people who eat gar. But they are a good tasting fish and they're a fun fighter. So uh, a lot of times you end up in areas that are super heavily populated with gar, especially as we get into June, July. You start hanging out at the lake or you're on the river uh, and you'll notice and they surface. And so that's cool, too, because a lot of times you can sight cast to the fish in the general area that they're at because they were surfacing. So gar are definitely one of, you know, the must do non game fish species here that we have in Oklahoma, because they're a blast to catch. Um, they're good to eat if you want to eat them, but you can make your own lures and it's very rewarding in fishing, like tying flies and catching fish on flies that you tied. Same deal goes for the rope lure. It's pretty rewarding to catch fish on something that you made right there at home and then caught the fish. But this is my recommendation for gar fishing, especially for your three smaller species, um, your alligator gar. You might get a big take on, you know, something like this, but more than likely you're just going to be targeting those long nose. And occasionally if you're in the right areas, you might pick up a spotted or a uh, short nose gar, but that covers, you know, the gar species of that. And with these always use, please use the chat bar at any time. You got questions, you, uh, fishing, anything start in the chat bar. We'll address it as we go. So the next species that we're going to go to is the drum. So like I said, at the beginning of the presentation, drum are typically the most caught non-game species. And they're almost 
always caught incidentally. Not a lot of people out there just, you know, targeting drum because you really, you know, like any fish species, it's kind of hard to target. You get incidental catch a lot of the time, especially when you're dealing with fish that eat similar uh, baits and lures as a lot of your game fishes do. So really a good place to target drum uh, is going to be in marinas, along riprap on dam. They inhabit a lot of the same areas on bigger water that your largemouth bass were, are going to inhabit. And so a lot of people catch them when they're bass fishing. But you can use a wide range of lures um, and live bait for uh, drum. If you're going to go the live bait route or just bait route in general, your best bet is probably going to be a live worm. So either a red worm, night crawler, fished off the bottom with some weight. Your weight is going to be dependent on how far you need to be able to cast that thing, depth, current, wind, all that. Um, typically, if it's fairly calm outside, you're fishing, you know, in cover, like maybe a marina or you're fishing where you're not exposed to a lot of current or wind, a quarter ounce weight is plenty, either a no roll weight, uh, a bottom bouncing weight, uh, egg weight, uh, you typically with a barrel swivel or some, or like a Lindy rig swivel and then a leader line and then a hook. Uh, as far as hooks go, you really want to look for almost all these non-game species, especially they are so sensitive. So the drum will feed in different parts of the water column, but, and same with gar, but a lot of these other non-game species that we're going to talk about are carp, are buffalo. They do spend most of their time feeding off the bottom. Um, and so they have super sensitive uh, faces and their mouths, and they're just really, really sensitive to things that, you know, they aren't natural. So you're always best suited to stick to smaller thick wire hooks so really small circle hooks, really, I like octopus hooks, nice big wide gap on them, get good hook sets, but you're really looking for hooks that are going to kind of run in the size zero, basically. So, you know, maybe a one aught all the way down to like a size two, size four hook. So here's some little octopus hooks, but as you can see, these hooks are, you know, not much bigger than my fingernail. So looking for stuff like these, but the big key with the non-game is that using small hooks, you got to make sure that you're getting thick wire hooks. So the difference between a big thick wire hook like this and more of a, this is still a thick wire hook, but it's, it's still a lot thinner than this one. Now, if you get into like your panfish type hooks, your Aberdeen hooks, uh, those are going to be thin wire hooks, like crappie hooks, jig heads, and these big, big fish, they can straighten your hook out pretty easily. Um, most of these non-game species, aside from the gar, rely heavily on their shoulders and their head when they're fighting. They have a lot of power, so they're going to be shaken and putting a lot of pressure and tension on your line and on your rod. And if you're using thin wire hooks, you're probably going to get your hook straightened out. So big key, small hooks either trebles or single points that are thick wire that are somewhere in the size one aught at the biggest down to like a size four at the smallest. But you can get a lot smaller than that if you're going to be like micro fishing, uh, fishing clear water streams and things like that. But uh, live worms are great for all fish species, um, but your non-game species, especially ones that are feeding along the bottom, um, your worm is going to be one of your better bets. Now you can use like, artificial commercial baits, punch baits, stink baits, dough baits, something like this that they sell that are like pellets. You can put those on a hook, but uh, that's going to be your best bet as far as like live bait fishing, but looking for areas that are usually protected. A lot of times if you have some clearer water, you can see the disturbances that are in the water um, where those fish, when they're bottom feeding, they'll leave these big plumes of the sediment around. So if you see a big sediment line and you don't see a boat that maybe got its trolling motor or it's outboard churning up the bottom, that's a good indication of where non-game species are chewing up the bottom. And that could be drum, it could be buffalo, it could be uh, carp, but th those are good telltale signs. But typically when you're fishing the big water, the big lakes, your marinas, your dams, um, anywhere where there's kind of that transition between lots of good structure 
as well as some protected water. That's typically where you'll find a lot of those fish. Um, always on the wind driven side. So here in Oklahoma, summertime, winds usually blown out of the south. So the north ends of the water bodies, the north sides in those coves and marinas and public access areas or dams where that south and southwest winds are just blowing bait and nutrients and organisms and it pushes them all up into that shallow water. And that's where you're going to see those big non-game fish. So north ends of the lakes are where you really want to focus. But any of those types of areas are more than likely going to have a pretty good um, population of non-game species at any given time when you're out fishing from April all the way in through like October. Um, a lot of these non-game fish are a lot more heat tolerant of the water than some of our game species are. So when you're largemouth bass and you're crappie, uh, as they push offshore in the summer, when it's just super hot, water temps are in the 80s, a lot of these non-game species are much more tolerant. So they will stay for bank anglers in those easy, accessible, shallow public access places that a lot of your game species will kind of abandon during the middle of the day uh, come the summer months. So you get a lot of that incidental catch anyways of people who are out um, fishing with, uh, you know, live bait, a minnow or a worm, thinking they're going to catch bass or catfish and they end up catching drum and buffalo and, and sucker species. Um, So, uh, as far as lures go for your drum, like I said, they they eat fish. So a lot of people will catch them on like jigs, little swim baits and things like that. But if you are fishing out around dams or in marinas, especially at this time of year, good baits for catching drum, targeting drum are going to be small swim baits that are going to be two and a half inches or less. So these storm wild eyed pre-molded shad something in just a basic shad color so whites silvers maybe if you're fishing some really dingy water um something with some chartreuse in it but real small pro bait profiles tip of the finger down to the knuckle and that's what you're looking for hook points that are close to the rear of the bait you don't want to have hook points that are like center body or closer to the front those drums still have downward facing mouths. So unlike most of your game species where their mouths are right off of the front, most of these non-game species, carp, buffalo, drum, suckers, they have these downward facing mouths and that's for suctioning stuff up off the bottom because most of them are feeding along the bottom uh, the majority of the time. But same retrieve speeds that you would use essentially if you're fishing for largemouth bass. The great thing about catching drum is catching drum is basically like catching bigger largemouth. Um, they fight fairly similar. They have a really good fight. They like to head shake. They're not going to go airborne like a largemouth, but they'll bulldog you and they'll look for structure to run into. Um, but typically your average size drum here in Oklahoma is going to be in between about two and six pounds. So gives you really a similar fight that you're going to get to for largemouth. And because you're going to target them in areas that you would target largemouth, a lot of times you're catching both species uh, while you're fishing. Um, baby shad, a lot of people that are crappie fishing this time of year uh, using you know, baits like this. So again, natural type colors are blue and chartreuse is a big winner here in Oklahoma. They're nice and bright when they're out here out of the box, but when you get baits that are in kind of this color pattern underwater, they really do a great job of mimicking our shad. Uh, they get a lot of that iridescent shine to them. The blue really lightens up and the chartreuse gives you kind of that flash. So anything with like blue backs and chartreuse or orange bodies, are really good at mimicking a lot of the natural uh, bait sources that these fish see. But throwing something like this, when you're out crappie fishing, you're probably using like a 32nd or a 16th ounce jig head. That's going to be perfect. And either fish below a bobber or just cast and retrieved. But baits that are in this kind of swim bait profile are going to be your best bet at catching drum with artificials. Now you can catch them on crankbaits. You can catch them on lipless crankbaits. You can catch them on rooster tails. You can catch them on pretty much anything that you're going to catch bass with. Um, but your big winners, if you really are just looking to get in 
to drum more often than not fishing in areas that are going to have those fish. It's going to be your swim bait, two and a half inches, smaller shad patterns. That's going to get you bit more often than not. And then you can never go wrong really anywhere you go fishing, especially if you're camping, got kids, maybe you're new to fishing, uh, rod and reel with a weight and a hook and a live worm fished off the bottom or below a bobber, but typically off the bottom, you're going to get more bites. Um, from your species when you're fishing in those, you know, camping areas or marinas, wherever you may be. But if you take a day to the lake, uh, always having a cup of worms with you uh, typically is, you know, how you're going to get bit the most often. Um, and if you have a good shoreline or maybe you're out on some docks or things like that, you can get your bait rod set up, put it in a rod holder, prop it up against something and have that going. And then you can wander, you know, a few yards in either direction of the shoreline fishing with, uh, artificial lures for, you know, non-game species and game species, always keeping an eye on your bait uh, rod. So that's typically what I'll do. Anytime that I go to a big reservoir, I'll always have a bait rod with me and it's typically going to be lined with a live night crawler or red worm using like a size one, size two octopus hook. And if I'm fishing in sheltered water, I'm probably using a quarter ounce weight. Uh, if it's super windy, I'll go up to a half ounce, but most of the time when I'm fishing in still water, a lake or a reservoir, I try not to get up and above like a half ounce weight just because these fish are so sensitive. When you put that weight, you have it on your main line. Don't secure your weight to anything. Make it so that when you run your line through. So if we had our, I'm going to take some line here and just show a basic bottom setup of what's going to work for cart, drum, um, as well as your game species that are roaming around your buffalo, your suckers. Uh, so we're going to take one of our small size two octopus hooks, and then we're going to grab a couple different weight options. So you can see, but we'll take a half ounce egg weight. And we will take a quarter ounce, um, quarter ounce casting weight. And then we're going to use a medium size barrel swivel. So to go fishing, this is the easiest way to get out of Walmart or your local bait and tackle shop to just go hit the lake and go catch a bunch of fish during the summer. This is all you need. A couple of different weight options. Find one that you like that you can cast a pack of medium sized swivels, barrel swivels, and then a pack of just some type of thick wire, wide gap, circle hook, octopus hook, just something that's a thick wire hook like this, or just a regular old bait holding um, hook. And then all you need to do is get a couple worms and you're ready to go fishing. So we'll use the egg weight. So you just take your main line, nothing on the end of it, and you're gonna run that weight uh, onto your main line. Then we're gonna take, well, first what we should probably do, since I don't have a spool of line laying around, is if you're not using something like a Lindy rig, which is gonna come in a pack of two, and it's gonna have a, a swivel, a leader lines and hooks. So, but if you don't do that, all you gotta do is cut like a foot and a half, two feet of line of your main line and just set it aside for a second. So we'll cut that, set that to the side for a second, and then we'll put our weight on. And then whatever fishing knot you like to use. So this is a good bait. This is one of my catfish rods. So it's got 12 pound monofilament, pretty good sturdy line. It's a medium heavy action rod. So with that, because it is that thicker line, I'm just going to do a Palomar knot. So Palomar knot with these big eye holes is basically just bend the line over, double it over like that, and then push it through the eye hole. So it's resting on those two pieces of line like that. And then we're just going to make a simple overhand knot like that. And that loop that we now have at the end of our line, we're going to run the swivel through that loop, pull the loop up over the excess uh, overhand knot that you made. So that, get it on the line, wet it down, 
cinch it tight. That's going to be the quickest, easiest way to get your line on. Now, if you're using thinner line, so probably, you know, 10 pound test is kind of what I consider the cutoff between like light action line and heavier action line, like 10 pound is right there. So the 10 pound, you could either do an improved clinch, try to lean knot or a Palomar. But the second you start to get under 10 pounds, using an improved clinch knot is going to be better suited for you. It's got stronger break strength. So now what we have is the em empty side of our barrel swivel down here. So we're going to grab that piece of leader line that we cut off and then we're going to attach it on. So with this, you can either do a Palomar or you can do an improved clinch. It's a little wonky doing the Palomar because you don't really have anything to push through. So we got to pull the line through. So we're holding it like this. So then you got to take the end of your tagline of that leader and run that through the loop, just like it was the lure. And then we're going to pull up above that excess again. And then we're just going to cinch it all down. But in this case, because it is kind of wonky, because you're doing it basically upside down, you don't have something to push through it. Doing an improved clinch right there on your leader line to make sure that your leader line is nice and snug, because ultimately we're going to have three knots. So you want to make sure that all your knots are nice and tight and well tied because you have three points where there could be a failure uh, when you hook a fish up. So then we take our hook, take the end of our tagline. Again, just going to do a Palomar knot with this thick line. Overhand loop, pull the hook through that loop up over the excess, wet it, cinch it tight and cut off all your tags. And this is what your basic bottom rig is gonna look like. So when you cast this out, the weight drives it down to the bottom, sits it on the bottom, you reel up your slack, and that barrel ends up hitting the weight. Always make sure that, now these are nice and easy, they got real small holes on them, but a lot of times you'll end up with like a casting weight like this, it's got some bigger eye holes on it. You need to make sure that you're using swivels that are big enough that the eye hole or the hole of the weight cannot go up and over like the swivel can't slide through it. So it's important to make sure that all your equipment is secured like that. So the thing about having the weight on your main line when you're fishing, and especially for our non-game species, like I said, are super sensitive with their touch and their taste. Um, if they feel anything that is suspicious, they're going to let it go immediately. They do not give you the same luxury, come back and bite it again. You know, a lot of our game species, our sunfishes, our temperate bass, our catfish, they'll play with a bait sometimes if they're unsure about it, but they'll stick with it. Your non-game species, especially like carp, they're going to take one look at it. Carp are super intelligent, um, like most invasive species that end up in places they shouldn't be, uh, they end up being the smartest creatures that you got there, kind of like feral hogs, super intelligent, very, very hard to eradicate when they become a problem. But for us here in Oklahoma, carp, at least the normal European carp, grass carp, really haven't posed a great threat. We do have some of the Asian carp species, um, the big heads and silvers that are doing significant damage to fisheries across the country. We have not seen reproduction yet. So we have some of the biggest big head and silver carp in the world right here in Oklahoma. Uh, Grand Lake, for example, um, these fish are just not reproducing. So whether it be the habitat or whatnot, we're not seeing reproduction, but we are seeing the fish that have gotten into that water system grow to these amazing sizes. So for example, over in Tennessee, Kentucky, where they have a really bad silver and big head problem, most of the big fish over there are 20 pounds. Big fish here in Oklahoma are 60 to 80 pounds. So attain really great weights. Most people catch those snagging for paddlefish and they just accidentally hit one. But it's kind of like hitting a needle in a haystack because there's not very many of them. But the big thing with this is this is free on the line. So underwater, our hook, our night crawler or our red worm that we would thread onto our hook and our swivel are essentially weightless underwater. So with the water pressure and all that, this is pretty much just free. So when this is sitting down on the bottom and that fish comes and grabs your bait, 
So another thing that you might look to get um, with your rod and reel setup is something called a bait clicker. And they're going to come on these casting reels for the most part. Sometimes they might be on a spinning reel, but most of the time you find them on casting or spin casting equipment. So right here is what's called the bait clicker. And you can turn that on. And what the bait clicker allows is when a fish grabs it, it can pull it with your bail still closed. So it's basically like having a really loose drag. So with if you're using a spinning uh, setup, your spinning reel, you can just loosen your drag cap. So when those big fish come and take it, what they, what they can do is they can swim freely. Now, what fish don't really care about for the most part, now carp are a little bit different, but for the most part, all your other species, they really don't care that much about hook points. So if they feel the hook point in their mouth, they're used to eating things all the time that have pinchers and barbs and everything else that they're eating naturally. So they really don't care that much about the little prick of, you know, the hook point in their mouth. But what they do care about is that tension. When they feel any resistance, that's when they really freak out. And with our non-game species, they're more than likely just going to drop the bait and leave it alone and not come back for it. So when you're free, when your weight is free on your main line, when you get bit and they start to pull and then you have a bait clicker, or you have your drag set really loose, they're able to just take that line and they never feel the weight. But it indicates to you at your rod tip, you know, if it grabs it and goes, your line's just, you know, your rod's going to start going. But if it maybe it's pecking at it, like a drum or something might be hitting it a couple of times to work it into its mouth, you're going to get that good quintessential like thump, thump, thump to indicate a bite. But if you go and secure your weight, let's say you were using like a snap swivel instead of a barrel swivel, and you connected your leader line into your snap swivel and then attached your weight into that and have this tied to your main line, the second that that fish, so if this was our setup right here, the second that uh, that fish goes to hit it, it's going to feel the kickback of the weight fighting against it. So with non-game species and really any bottom bouncing approach, it's best to make sure that your weight is free on your line. Now, if you're fishing, let's say you're fishing in a river or maybe you're fishing in an area that's got a lot of like big rocky outcroppings or a lot of hardwood uh, flooded timber, you might look at using something like a no roll weight, something like this that's flat. So when this lands down on the bottom, it stays like this. What can happen with these casting weights and these egg weights is that they can roll underwater a little bit. You know, you go to cinch up, take some of the slack out of your line once you've casted it out. And these just have a tendency to work themselves into little, you know, cracks and rocks or up underneath a log. So they're great when you're fishing in like open water. So if you're in a marina, um, you're fishing in like a cove at a camping area, something like that, where it's just nice, shallow, sandy kind of sloping out. Those are good places for your egg weights and your casting weight. But if you're fishing in like a river um, or you're fishing maybe off of the dam, somewhere where you might get hung up, you might look to utilize, you know, kind of some no rolls or some uh, bottom bouncing weights, just something like a little aplomb weight that's got um, maybe a little kink in it that'll sit up off the, like they're meant to be trolled and kind of bounce along the bottom. Those are good ones. And you can find those if you go to a big box retailer, like a Bass Pro or a Cabela's, they're going to have what are called Lindy rigs. And it's a little tiny package. It's only about this big. It says Lindy rig up at the top, black, yellow writing on it. It'll say Lindy rig and it'll come in a two pack and you'll get these leader lines and then these swivels. Their swivels are a little unique. It's got the barrel eye on one side, but instead of a snap swivel or another uh, just eye, what they end up having is kind of this kinked wire that wraps around and you have a uh, your leader line. So your hook's already attached to your leader line. And at the end of the leader line is a loop, kind of like a snelled uh, hook that you'd find to use for like trout or walleye. And what you do is you just pull that loop down where the little uh, pin kind of comes off where that wire's wrapped around and then it cinches down into the little circle. Um, but Lindy rigs are great because it, it's super easy. You just take them right out and they already have the weight, but the weight that comes with it is a little bottom bouncing weight that's meant to be trolled behind a boat and it kind of bounces along the bottom, but it is great for bottom fishing um, when you're on the bank. 
because they're very difficult to get snagged up. So either those type of weights, and you can buy weights like that if you just go look at a Lindy Rig package and then go to the weight section, you can find those types of weights and just buy that if you wanted to take that route. Or a no roll weight, just something like that. But I love no roll weights when I'm out in the river. Um, you start using egg weights, casting weights when there's current, they're going to get pushed around and moved everywhere. Um, and when you're in the river, depending on flow, probably starting off with at least an ounce weight to get you down to the bottom all the way up to three, four ounces if that river current is really pushing through there. But the no rolls are great when you're in the river system. So this is going to be kind of the similar setup for any type of bottom fishing you're going to do uh, for any of the non-game species. And then with this hook, or if you put like a small treble hook on, either way, whatever your preference is, then you can go with like the commercial dough bait. You can go with the live uh, minnow, leech, uh, worm. You can catch grasshoppers off the bank. Grasshoppers are always a underutilized, uh, great resource available to us during the summer. And fish love grasshoppers. So um, handful, fill up a cup of grasshoppers off the bank and throw those out there off the bottom. And you'll catch all sorts of different species. Um, but grasshoppers are a great alternative bait that not a lot of people remember to think of. Um, and it's a free bait and it's usually readily available right where you're fishing at. But, uh, all those types of baits, the commercial produced or your typical live baits are all going to be effective. Um, you can always like, if you really want to get like in on a certain species, like a carp, for example, uh, you can just YouTube, uh, type into the search bar, uh, specialty baits or, or what bait to use for carp. And a lot of people who target these fish um, as the majority of their, their favorite species, they've come up with all sorts of different types of homemade bait, crunching up like uh, sugary cereal in a five gallon bucket, pouring in Mountain Dew and Kool-Aid and all different types of things that are kind of that sugary, sweet scent uh, that it gives off. And they'll make their own dough paste and use that for carp and catfish and um, some of your other non-game species. So you can always go down the rabbit hole on YouTube for different um, non-game species. You can also go to our website, wildlifedepartment.com, check out our fishing resources tab. And within that, in the learn to fish section, you're going to find some species videos. And if you go into the non-game species, I've put up some of the videos that I like from YouTube on there of people who use their own, you know, their own carp bait that they made and things like that. So you can always check out those videos if you want to get really specific, but just as a good general rule of thumb, when you're out there fishing from the bank, uh, when you're using bait, a setup just like this, and then, you know, typically a couple worms is going to be good enough, but good alternate baits are going to be your grasshoppers, um, leeches, anything that you can get a hold of that they sell at, you know, bait and tackle shops. So with that, Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you would look to go. Like what are, what are good public bodies of water where you might go find some of these uh, non-game species that are fairly easy to catch in those areas. You have great bank access. Uh, one of my favorite parts of the entire state is the Illinois River system. So you have the main stem, the north, uh, the upper Illinois River that runs just right out of Tahlequah lots of public access along it that we own. Uh, there's GRDA land, there's core uh, property around, uh, there's all of the float outfitters. So if you're doing a float trip and you're staying at one of those outfitters, they have river access right behind them. Those are all great places to target uh, big sucker fish. And as we get into the summer months, the Illinois is just packed with uh, non-game species. So when you're floating down the river, especially if it's low flow. So with the big thing with the Illinois River is going to be your flow. So when you start to get up above about 800 CFS approaching a thousand, that's about kind of the, you know, where it's fishable for like smallmouth bass. You start to get over a thousand and the water gets pretty murky and it is a clear water stream. And these are site, you know, type feeders a lot of the time. So uh, looking for CFS flows on the Illinois that are going to be somewhere between like 400 and 800, which is pretty standard during the summer months. And you're going to be, you know, good to go. But looking at big, deep holes or big, long runs. So if you have a big, long run, just consistent water, kind of bank to bank, even depth, even current, not a lot of uh, uh, impediments or laydowns 
of uh, that are going to force stronger current. That's going to be good places where big non-game fish are going to stack up big holes. So where you get big log jams or the river turns and you get the big shallow tail out riffle section that dumps into your pool. Those are going to be the areas that you look to target. Um, but typically all the entire river system, you know, no matter where you're fishing from the bank, you're probably along a run somewhere where you're going to have those non-game species. And it could be, you know, anything from Buffalo to drum to carp to river suckers. There's lots of cool, unique species that you can catch in the Illinois. And a great way to do it is throwing just a, you know, good old live worm right off the bottom. Now for like fly anglers or even using, you know, spinning equipment, you can put a bobber on and put a little fly below it, little nymph flies, real small size 16, 18s, 20s, uh, maybe even 22s, like really, really, really small bugs. Um, but basic mayfly patterns, so pheasant tail nymphs, prince nymphs, um, those are you know going to be common bugs that are in there. So you can catch these great big sucker fish on these little itty bitty tiny flies if you're fly fishing. Uh, but you can also throw those nymph flies out underneath a bobber and that bobber gives you enough weight. So using a big circle bobber, it's going to give you enough weight to be able to cast it because if you were to tie a fly, even a nymph fly um, with a bead head on it to the end of like a spinning rod or a spin casting rod, you go to cast it, there's no weight. So you're not going to be able to move your line. But if you put a bobber on the line, that's your weight. So you can deliver a fly and then drift it through the water. Um, but you're going to need to get it down on the bottom. So fly anglers find more success with the European style uh, of uh, nymphing, which is basically using like a tungsten bead head of, of your bottom bug. If you're using a dropper or if you're just using a single fly, because it's really important to get those flies right down on the stream bed. Um, a lot of times if you don't have enough current or if you're using that float, you know, that fly is going to be bouncing along, bouncing along, bouncing along. Then it gets up underneath the rock and then you're, you know, snagged up. So trying to catch those river suckers and non-game species on a fly rod or just using flies with uh, like spinning equipment is really fun because you're going to catch these great big fish. But depth control is super important. So you really want to look to target a big, long run where the current is even and the depth is even. That way, when you set your bobber or your strike indicator to where your bug is at, where that bait is, you want that bait to essentially be within, you know, the closest you can get it to the bottom, the better, but you definitely want to be within six inches of the bottom. So, you know, rivers, the channel changes and all that. So if you're fishing these little tight pocket water areas, setting your bug at a certain depth, you, you know, your strike zone is only going to be, you know, a few feet before it runs into shallower water and then it gets snagged up. So looking to target big, long runs that you find on the Illinois, on the Barren Fork, uh, you know, they're pretty traditional streams, free flowing streams as they go through. So you're going to have your prototypical pool turning into a big, long run, moving into a shallow tail out into the riffle section back into a pool. So most of the river, you get these you know, every couple hundred yards, you're going to get a big, long run of at least, you know, 20, 30 yards all the way up to a couple hundred yards. And those are the great places to look when you want to go target uh, fish on the Illinois. But that's probably my favorite place to fish in the state, mainly because I'm a big uh, smallmouth stream guy. So I love to smallmouth fish. But a lot of times when I'm over there, if I got a lot of time on my hands, I will take the time to go, you know, target those big uh river suckers and buffalo and drum fishing off the bottom and it's fun with the fly rod. So get a lot of multi-purpose out of the Illinois and the Barren Fork system. And there's just a ton of public land. We own two properties on the Barren Fork. There is basically uh, gravel access on the Illinois, you know, every river mile from the 62 bridge that goes into Tahlequah all the way up to where the river turns to go to Chewy Bridge. That, that essentially gives you a good section of, uh, you know, significant river mileage where you can go to these public locations, pull your vehicle down onto the, you know, most of them have parking areas or you can pull your vehicle down on the gravel bars and just fish right there and make an entire day out of it. Um, but they're not a lot of hangups, you know, nice cobble, clear stream, great places to fish. Um, with the weather being as hot and cold as it's been, how is it likely to affect fishing around Oklahoma? So 
This rain is great. Uh, the the cold air, um, so primarily focusing on white bass right now, our temperate bass species, but primarily white bass. Because water temperatures were fairly warm, we had a pretty mild winter. So when we rolled around into March and April this year, uh, our water temps were there for a lot of our game species that start their spawning activity, your crappie, your white bass, your largemouth bass, even some of your sunfishes. Um, the water temps were there, but species like white bass that are preferable for going upstream migration, so they prefer the inflowing rivers and creeks that come into the main lake that they live in, they want to be able to go up river and that takes rain. And we have had almost none of that outside of the southeastern part of the state uh, with the water temps. So right now we're looking at 75% of the state that has not had a white bass run yet. And that is happening like as we speak right now. So fishing is going to be great this weekend if you can get out to a creek or a river uh, to white bass fish. Um, this is going to be the run this weekend. Now these lower temperatures, north cold front, cold rain coming in, it probably is going to have a little bit of an adverse effect on your crappie, on your largemouth bass that you know, a lot of areas I've seen largemouth bass spawning before the crappie were spawning, um, which isn't usually typical. Typical, your crappie go first. Your white bass usually go first with your walleye, then your crappie go, then your largemouth go, then your sunfish go, and then your catfish go. And that's kind of the progression of the spawning season for our game species. So yeah, if you're fishing in lakes and ponds right now, um, you're probably going to see a little bit of a dip in activity, especially for the fish that were, we're just kind of right on that precipice of these fish are all trying to spawn. Now we're going to be jacking with water levels, rising water. So you're going to have feeding largemouth bass take advantage of that, but crappie are super finicky with water stable. Um, so rising water is going to, you know, kind of freak them out with their spawning. And then it's going to drop because all these dams around the state are going to start letting water out as it's coming in. So you're going to have rising and falling water fluctuations, as well as surface water temperatures dropping, you know, from what it was last week, you could have anywhere as much as, you know, seven, eight, maybe 10 degree drop in surface temperatures in that shallow water. So there will be some adverse effects, but we're really in the heart of good fishing. And once those fish have made the decision to go into their spawning process, weather typically doesn't affect them. Um, they're going to go through with it unless it's just something major. So be on the lookout today through this weekend of excellent white bass fishing uh, on creeks and rivers statewide. And when they're going, you know, you're always going to have your drum mixed in, your carp mixed in and things like that. So great. I mean, you can take a live minnow. This would be a great time to live bait fish if you're into bait fishing. You want to fish off the bottom, go find yourself a spot on one of our prairie streams around the state and set up with like a live minnow off the bottom or a worm. You're going to catch white bass and you're going to catch lots of non-game species. So this is one of our peak weeks of the year. Um, it's a bummer that the temperatures are a little bit lower than we'd like. You know, you'd, you'd prefer you'd be getting this rain with mid 60s to mid 70s instead of mid 40s to mid 50s. But we'll take the rain. We're not going to complain. It's uh, much needed. So, yeah, definitely. This is the weekend to get out to go fishing for anything. But this is going to be one of the peak windows for uh, your white bass. So definitely something to check out. Uh, let's see. So Buffalo, so Buffalo are pretty cool. Buffalo can get great big sizes and we have small mouth and we got big mouth Buffalo. Uh, they're kind of funky looking fish, their heads, they got like these big bulging black eyes on them. So when you get them out of the water, they kind of have this alien look to them. Um, but they're superb fighters. They're, you know, just these big tanks and they will just bulldog you down on the bottom. Um, one of the places that has kind of become a buffalo hotspot for trophy sized fish is Chimney Rock Lake, or it's known by three different names. So, Chimney Rock Lake, WR Holloway, or Pumpback. One of those three, it's all the same body of water. But depending on where you live, how you grew up, um, who you learned the lake's name from, it's got three different names. But uh, Chimney Rock is probably our trophy uh, buffalo. So if you live in and around the Tulsa area, not that far of a drive for you, but it's really not that far from Oklahoma City either. But that is our kind of trophy. That's where the last few state records have come out of. Um, and there's some people who go there and specifically target those uh, trophy uh, buffalo. So that's a that's a good one to go to. And it's got pretty good public bank access. Um, 
really any of your reservoirs. The great thing about non-game species is that they're just so abundant, um, mainly because they're not targeted. So all your game species are constantly being targeted and, uh, you know, being ripped out for harvest or dying incidentally because of, uh, you know, being caught in bad hooks or, you know, not proper fish handling. So your game species take a big hit. Your non-game species are really, you know, 95% of the non-game species that are caught are caught incidentally. They're caught while you're fishing for something else. Um, so they are very abundant. You can find them in any major lake, river, creek in the state. And even some city lakes and ponds are going to have a mixture of drum or carp or maybe gar um, that you'll find in them. But all your big lakes, it's it, it really is the, the great thing. I mean, it's how I learned how to fish growing up. Um, dads and uncles and grandpa go out on the boat and they go walleye or smallmouth fishing and, you know, kids be back at the campsite and we'd be sitting up against, you know, some cove or wherever we were camped out on the water. And we'd be out there fishing with, you know, marshmallows off the bottom or kernels of corn or live worms, whatever we could use. And you're bait fishing and dads and uncles and grandpas would come back from their fishing trip, you know, with one or two fish that we we're going to eat. And, you know, oh, fishing wasn't very good. And here's a bunch of little kids that have been, you know, crushing four to 12 pound carp and uh, it was mainly carp for us. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest. So mostly we're catching carp, uh, didn't have the same like Buffalo and, and drum, uh, up there that we do down here. But I learned how to fish carp fishing essentially with marshmallows and worms and, and dough bait. And it's great. Cause when you go camping, you just really don't think about it. You know, you got these nice shallow waters. You got these great big game species that most people don't eat, even though you can eat carp, you can eat drum you can eat buffalo uh there's lots of ways you can youtube uh you know how to process and how to clean and a lot of people eat them and um if you process and and clean and cook all of these fish properly they all taste good um really where you get that fishy taste most of the time is just fish weren't properly uh processed you didn't get all the red meat or you took the wrong parts of the fish but um they're readily ab abundant and they're also of great size, you know, so it's great for new anglers or for kids because you can take them to your local pond, your close to home pond, and you can catch sunfish all day long right now. You know, next couple of months you go out there with a small hook, piece of split shot and a real, you know, small circular bobber or a real thin stick bobber, kernel of corn, crappie nibble, cricket, grasshopper, piece of a live worm, and you're going to catch sunfish all day. But, you know, you're catching fish that, you know, a big sunfish is 10, 11 inches. I mean, that's a major trophy size fish. Well, if you go to your, you know, your big lake right now, especially as we get into the warmer months, typically I think a non-game fish is really picking up in kind of the middle of May once water temperatures really start to get up into the mid to high 60s into the low 70s is when those non-game fish really start to get active and feed and push in shallow. But you spend a lot of time, you know, camping or just at your local lake and you're, you know, fishing for crappie and bass and all this. And, you know, you may or may not be having much success, but you put a bait rod out there into the same locations. You're much more likely to catch more fish, bigger fish. Um, and it's just a better fishing experience because you get out there. You want to you want to put something big on the end of your line. So non game species, just really bait fishing off the bottom. Um in May and June in Oklahoma is just a great way to catch a bunch of fish, catch lots of big fish. And it's great for new, new people to fishing or uh, for kids who, you know, might get a little distracted, can't sit still for too long. So having bait rods going where maybe they're playing in the park that's right there, or running the shorelines or, or doing whatever. When that rod starts to go over, you know, you pull the kids back over, hand them the rod, hook up the fish, and then they get to fight this big fish. And it really piques that interest. And I think, you know, that was really one of the big motivators for me at a young age of uh, fishing was catching these great big carp and trying to figure out, you know, why why the dads and, and uncles and grandpas were out there, you know, trying to catch two pound fish intentionally when we're back catching 10 pound fish, you know, unintentionally just throwing marshmallows and kernels of corn out. So um, is it okay seeing any many snakeheads? I have not heard of any confirmed reports of snakeheads in the state. Now we do have native bowfin, um, which are a, they look very similar um to a snakehead and they exist in very small populations in the very southeast corner of the state 
There's a couple of small lakes down there, one in which we own the Red Slough WMA. So that very, very southwest or southeastern corner of McCurtain County down on the Red River. Uh, there's a few lakes down there that have some pretty good populations of bowfin that are in them, um, but they look just like uh, snakeheads and they're an aggressive fish. So your bowfins, you ever made a, a trip all the way down there? I think, I think it's Aussie Cobb is the lake. Uh, that we own that has some bowfin in it. Um, but you target them like you target bass. They'll take top water. Uh, they're very aggressive. Um, so they're going to take swim baits, crank baits, spinner baits, anything you would target largemouth bass with, you can target bowfin with. And, you know, they're kind of shaped. They end up, they look like an eel. They have these kind of eel like heads on them. And then they kind of thin out as their body goes, but they're pretty cool. And they're a native species here. Um, but you don't, don't hear a lot about them just because they are so confined to this one little pocket of the state. So we just don't see a whole lot of them caught or pictures shared um, unless, you know, somebody just happened to be down in the area and send us a photo. But yeah, they're pretty cool. Um, your carp, you know, carp are going to be everywhere. Uh, your big grass carp, there's certain areas that are better than others, you know, just lakes that maybe got stocked back in the 60s or 70s with these grass carp for weed control or or different types of uh, aquaculture control. A lot of fish just end up getting flooded out of fish farms, end up in river systems, and that's how they kind of expand their territory. But um, carp are non-native fish. So unlike our non-game species that we've mentioned, our drum, our buffalo, our bowfin, um, our gar, those are native fish. So they, they are meant to be here. A lot of times non-game fish are referred to as trash fish and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, they are some of the coolest fish species that are out there, but because they are more difficult to clean and harvest, you know, you started to get this difference between game fish and non game fish back at a time in America when fish was a staple of people's diets. People went out all across the country, caught their dinner, brought it home. Well, things that are super easy to clean, like largemouth bass, like crappie, nice fillets that come off of them, no red meat, uh, just got to cut the rib cages out. So they were, you know, more sought after. They were, they were prized because they were table fair. Well, your big non-game species now, they're just harder to clean. And so people didn't put as much attention to them. And then you get a lot of misconceptions about, you know, maybe they're undesirable because they are taking forage from more desirable species, for example. Um, like when we stock hybrid striped bass, you'll get a lot of kickback from largemouth bass anglers that say that the hybrid striped bass are adversely affecting the largemouth bass when they don't inhabit the same habitat. So they're not likely to impede on each other. Uh, carp though, carp can pose some problems. They really mess up the bottom of the lake bed cause a lot of sediment buildup so you it um they end up doing more damage uh than what they should be doing so carp are the one that shoot them you know shoot them with bows they're great walk the shoreline with the bow try to identify shoot carp but carp should always be eradicated when you catch carp punch the swim bladder throw them back out let them sink uh cut them up use them for catfish bait um but you Ideally, we would hope that every carp that is caught is killed. Um, they are an invasive species. They're not wanted. They have no purpose. They don't provide any positives to our ecosystems. They do damage to them. Um, but our drum, our buffalo, our gar, those are native species. They are good for the ecosystem. Um, they're meant to be there. They shouldn't be treated as trash fish. Um, bow fishermen especially really do some damage to our gar populations and they shoot a lot of buffalo and buffalo there's just now research that's being you know confirmed peer reviewed across the country for some of these non-game species that really fisheries agencies didn't spend a whole lot of time because they had limited resources so you put all your resources into your game species um because that's what your you know what what you guys what what us as the anglers what we want um, so you end up spending a lot of your time, money and effort on your game species. So we really didn't know a lot about some of these non-game species until very recently. And what we have found is that some of these fish are incredible. I mean, they are long lived fish. 
80, 90, 100, 110 years. So when you just go out there indiscriminately shooting fish because you're not identifying them and you're killing these buffalo and you're killing these drum that are, you know, are incredible fish. I mean, they were around before statehood uh, in Oklahoma. So really important, you know, to to place some some good emphasis on non-game species because one, they're bigger than most other fish. So they're awesome to fight and catch and and play but they should also be treated with respect and released and, and handled if you don't plan on eating the fish. So, but when it comes to carp, grass carp, any of the two major Asian carps, the big heads and the silvers, the common carps, those fish should all be eradicated when you catch them. Um, there's no use for them. And the easiest way is just to puncture them right in the middle with your pliers, pop that swim ladder, toss them back out. They'll sink other fish and turtles will eat them and they'll feed the ecosystem. Um, Best public access for Barren Fork. Uh, so we have two access spots. Um, one is our, our recently purchased property, Barren Fork WMA, um, which is almost on the Arkansas line. So it's right out of Stillwell. It's the farthest east public access that you get. Very, very cool stretch of water. A um, little bit more treacherous than the Bamberger WMA, which is farther downstream, a um, little bit closer to Tahlequah easier to get to, a lot better bank access and waiting access, not as many impediments. But the ban or the Barren Fork WMA is really cool. You get the mixed, uh, there's these big black uh, rocks that are kind of form the substrate and they're in different patterns, almost like somebody placed them there and they're huge, massive, like underwater or underground boulders, basically. They sit, so they're only coming up off the bottom about that. Don't step on them. They are incredibly slippery. Uh, I mistook, mistook one of them for moss on the bottom one time and stepped on it and took a swim. So definitely don't walk on them, but they're very cool because the water's crystal clear. So when you get up above, they form different checker patterns and you don't get that on the other parts of the Barren Fork that you can publicly access. But it is a more treacherous um, a walk. You get about a mile of river from the parking area. You can walk downstream in the river and it'll turn and it basically turns right onto the road. Well, there's a five line barbed wire that's up above that's really difficult to cross. So you essentially have to go beyond the bend and right there, you either have to swim across or find a crossing to be able to get up on these big rocky outcroppings that are right up against the road. And then it's about a quarter mile walk, half mile walk up the road back to the parking area if you don't want to just walk right back up the river. But there's lots of snags, lay downs. So great smallmouth bass habitat and there's a lot of cool non-game species but for me personally if i'm going to the barren fork and i'm looking for ease of access it's going to be the bamberger property you pull up right onto the river you walk right onto the river there's no big deep holes or anything you can get into not it's a pretty even section the water moves fairly similar and it's full of smallmouth too but those are our two properties and then if you go downstream the Eldon Bridge that was just redone. There's public access on the uh, southeast corner. So if you're coming from Tahlequah, when you drive across the Eldon Bridge, right when you get across it, you'll take a left. And right when you take a left, there's kind of a gravel area right next to the bridge that's up high. And you can park there and walk down. And you got a half mile of river right there. And then downstream of that, there's the Boy Scout Hole. Um, and then there's a core uh, there's another bridge down there that uh, the core runs. So there's there's five public access on Barren Fork and there's a couple dozen on the Illinois. So really good, really good uh, area to get over to, especially if you live in the Tulsa area. You're only an hour, hour and a half away. So that makes for a really great day trip. I live in central Oklahoma, but me and my wife will make the three hour drive over there for a Saturday just because, I mean, it's one of the coolest places in Oklahoma. Great public access and amazing fishing. Um, one of the places that is great for fishing, I'll just mention it. If you, if you're interested in stream fishing is, is blue river during the summer. Um, not as, not as much non-game species action in there. Uh, lots of channel cats, lots of spotted bass and some really, really nice smallmouth bass. Not a lot of them, but there's some real good ones that are in that river. Um, but blue river is a great public access place. Um, for people of all skill levels, ages, um, physical ability. You can either, there's nice handicap accessible spots where you can just sit and float uh, bait or sink bait, 
or you've got seven miles, basically a river up and down that you can wade the entire stretch or there's trails that run along it. So blue river is great. Um, uh, so trying to think of some other good areas that, you know, if you're up in the Northwest Canton, Canton's got a lot of different fish species in it, but it's going to have some big Buffalo and some big drum. Um, Canton's got great bake access when compared to other lakes, uh, that are similarly sized around the state. Canton's got 50 plus percent bank access. You have access to the entire dam. They've now finished their project below the dam. So you can actually fish the tailwater from the water level. If you've ever been to Canton before they had that open, you got to fish from the big seawall on the West end of the dam. And you're basically casting 30, 40 feet down into the pool. So if you ever hooked anything that was like over two or three pounds, you know, have to like drop a dip basket down or, you know, hope you could reel it up the seawall without snapping your line. But there's nice, easy access now down at the water's level that they finished that project. So Canton is really the jewel of the Northwest when it comes to, you know, most species of fishing, but it is a really good lake for catching some substantially sized uh, non-game species. Uh, we get down into the Southwest. I think of a lake like Altus Luger that, um, has been dealing again with a golden algae bloom. Um, I don't know where we're at on that. I haven't heard anything in the last month, but I do know that we are getting some reports of fish kills from golden algae bloom. That lake, it, it, it just can't catch a break. It seems like, you know, every decade now, it's like when we get these drought conditions, we're picking up this golden algae only on that lake. And golden algae is a, is a lake killer. Um, you know, it's going to do serious damage to the fish populations, but when it's up and running and uh, the water is clean, it is a you know great public access, nice big sandy bowls that go out, great habitat for your bottom feeding fish like your buffalo and drum and carp. They'll get up on those sandy shoals and work those. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a good public access one. Obviously, Texoma in the South Central, hard to beat Texoma, uh, good bank access great habitat, lots of different species, but, you know, Texoma is going to be your top producer for your non-game species and bank access down there in the South Central portion, pushing over into the Southeastern part of the state. Um, you, Hugo is a pretty good lake where you can fish below the dam. The Kayamichi River is a, is a really good river system down there to get into lots of different species of fish as you push back up into the east central that's where we start to run into our huge conglomerates of water bodies you're going to have the arkansas system meeting the illinois system meeting the verdigris meeting eufaula um, so meeting the canadian system so you have four major river systems that converge all right there around weber's falls so weber's falls when it's not flooding um good public access in and around weber's falls but you have below the dam at Eufaula, great public access. You've got below the dam and then our Helen and Simp Watts area uh, on the lower Illinois. Uh, the Verdigris, a little bit tougher. You can't, you, know, you need a boat really to get up on that. Um, and then you have the Arkansas that comes through. So you have Robert S. Kerr, Weber's Falls. Those are areas where you're likely to uh, bait fish below those tailwaters. You're going to get into a whole bunch of different types of fish. Um, striped bass, catfish, big non-game, you know, river fish. Uh, that Those are just kind of the melting pot of all the state's waters coming together right in a very consolidated window along the Arkansas River system. So east central part of the state, that's your good public access is all those tailwaters that come and converge right there at Weber's Falls. You push up into the northeast, you got some more options. Um, bank access starts to become a little bit more difficult. You know, you think of a lake like Grand Lake. Grand Lake's this great, big, huge, awesome fishery. Doesn't really have a lot of public bank access. Um, the dam below uh, Grand, so in Disney there, the Pensacola Dam, uh, that just is kind of hit or miss. You really need some flowing water. They need to be releasing a little bit to really get those fish active, both the game species and the non-game species. So if you're up in that northeastern area, that's when I start to think more like the Illinois River system. If I was going to go somewhere, great public bank access, opportunity to catch lots of different species of fish, great for all members of the family, all skill levels, especially the Barren Fork, Barren Fork, the Bamberger property that we have. 
Um, that's probably, that would be my number one recommendation for anybody who wanted to take kids, dogs, haven't, aren't really, you know, just getting into fishing, don't have a lot of confidence maybe yet. That's a great place to take little squirm and squirt tubes and, you know, little small, uh, let's see if we have any. And these will catch a drum too, but little tubes rigged inside with a little squirm and squirt head. But green pumpkin, this is my favorite color right here, this green pumpkin, red and black flake. But then just straight green pumpkin, little chartreuse tail. You can throw these around all day on the barren fork and catch dozens, if not hundreds, of smallmouth bass. But you're also going to catch the occasional drum or um, catfish, sunfish. So barren fork is a great place to go. Great bank access, easy wading. The water never really gets deeper than about three feet. So even for kids, you know, that's just on average. So your runs are going to be your three, four foot range, but most of the water that you're wet wading through, most of it's ankle to knee deep. So it's just a great place to go. Not a lot of overhang on the banks, not a lot of things to get hung up on. Lots of great back casting. Awesome place. If you're a beginner fly fisherman, you want somewhere where you can go and wet wade around and make a lot of casts and not have to deal with um, some of the problems that come with tight area casting. Got nice big gravel bars. So Bamberger, Property on the Barren Fork is definitely a top public destination um, in that northeastern part of the state. Then as we shift back over towards the metro, Caw is a tremendous fishery. I kind of think of Caw is like Texoma North. Um, it's a boundary water right up there. Basically, the lake itself is entirely in Oklahoma, where the New Kirk Bridge is at, where the Arkansas runs into the lake just upstream. You're in Kansas. Um, but Caw is a tremendous fishery, both above the lake right now. So Newkirk Bridge, if they're picking up any of this rain, white bass are going to be on up there. So if you live in and around Ponca, Stillwater, might go check out Caw this weekend, both below the dam and then up above at the Newkirk Bridge. Should be some pretty good fishing activity there. Um, then as we swing down into the Oklahoma City Metro, when I think non-game fishing, there's a lot of good opportunities here. We've got Overholzer, which is basically one big shallow sandy, you know, it does great with the hybrid striped bass, but not much else. So you get a lot of non-game species that are in there. Hefner always has a ton of drum. See lots and lots and lots of pictures that come from Hefner of those kind of box sized drum, your two to five pounders, but every now and then you'll get into those bigger 10, 15 pound drum. Um, and they're all over. People catch them on the dam, catch them over by the lighthouse, catch them in the marina. They just, drums seem to be all over that lake. Uh, Arcadia, there's some big non-game species in it. There's really good public access. All the metro lakes around Thunderbird, Arcadia, Overholzer, Hefner, um, Stanley Draper, West Watkins, all of them have great public access. So if you live in Oklahoma City Metro, you're not very far from finding a pretty big body of water that if you're going to go soak a worm or soak some processed bait, dough bait, grasshopper, you got lots and lots of public bank options. Uh, Thunderbird, Little River State Park, um, I think they changed the name uh, so it didn't get confused with the other Little River State Park down in the southeastern part of the state. So I think it's Lake Thunderbird State Park now, but it's the Discovery Point. Uh, it's right there on the southeast side of the dam, right off of Highway 9. There's five coves that have public access that come right off of the dam. That's great water year round. You have easy access out to the Little River Channel. You're right off the dam. So you got great transition structure from the River Channel into these protected coves. They're on the south side of the lake. So as the water temperatures warm up, they're not taking the same pounding of the wind. So you get nice sheltered water um, that you get a lot of fish species that come up and spawn, crappie, largemouth bass, and then your non-game species are going to push in there to feed as well. Um, Arcadia up off of 2nd Street, Edmond Street, uh, 172nd, whatever you want to call it if you live in the metro. Uh, right there, the Central State Park is... Uh, the overlook of the lake, it's right off of the northeast corner. So it's right off of the dam. And there's a big, long cove that comes in right off the dam. Again, similar circumstance to Thunderbird. Great transition structure out to that deeper water. This is on the north side of the lake. So it is constantly taking that south wind. Always lots of bait. There's always big carp, drum, 
up and around that, you're also likely to get into largemouth white bass and crappie. Um, if you're fishing in those areas, especially if you're fishing with bait off the bottom. And then there's some pretty good catfish that are out there as well. Um, Hefner, you pretty much have lake wide access. There's a trail that goes around the entire lake. Areas that you might look to target for those non game species like uh, Stars and Stripes Park. There's a big long cove. When it has water, it's probably dry right now because the lake's still about seven or eight feet low. Hopefully, this rain puts a little bit of a dent in it this week. Um, the marina right there at the golf course, that's a good access spot. You're always going to have a bunch of non game fish that are in marinas because people eat in marinas so they throw food in the water um and carp are pretty savvy they there's always big carp that spawn in there they'll run up underneath the docks you'll hear them hit in the docks that'll kick off here in the next probably month um when the water fills back up a little bit in that marina but there's some really good sized carp in there 20 30 40 pounders but they're pretty savvy uh they've seen a lot so getting after them you kind of have to get creative with some of the homemade baits or the punch baits to get after them. Um, but marinas are always a good place to look. So with that, that kind of brings us, uh, that brings us full circle. If anybody's got any questions, throw them in there. Um, finishing up this one a little bit early, but the non game fishing, not a lot of tackle to go through. So if there's any main takeaways from this presentation. It's just, you know, your rod and reel setup. So if you're just starting off fishing and you're just looking for something that you want to go do, catch some fish, relax, sit in a chair, enjoy the sunshine, have your cooler, just got a line soaking, don't want to get super involved with casting and retrieving, casting and retrieving, walking and moving. You know, there's no better time than late April through basically, I mean, for non-game species, late April all the way through the summer months into the back into the fall. But if you were going to get a rod, you know, your basic combo rod your your middle of the pack shakespeare ugly stick something like that probably a spin casting like a zebco 33 you're going to find all these different you know spin casting rods are great if you're just starting out you got the little button on it you don't have to deal with all the tangles and twists and bird's nests and you still have good drag action and everything like that and most of those are going to be medium action rods they're probably going to be pre-spooled already so they're going to have somewhere between eight and ten pound test on them which is perfect and that's really what you're looking to start off with. Um, you know, you're not always going to be catching giants. You have the opportunity to. That's where tailoring your equipment with something where maybe you're up in the medium heavy action rod using like 14 pound test, 17 pound test, something like that. Where if you do happen to hit that 20 plus pound fish, you got enough to, to still you have a lot of the control. If you're using that medium action rod, eight pound, 10 pound test, you hit a 20 pounder, you still can land it. There's no, you know, the whole purpose of your rod line and reel setup is to lay in fish. I mean, they're, they're designed to take that tension away. So as long as you have your drag set, um, you know, your drag, if you're, if you're not familiar with what your drag is on casting reels like this, bait casters, casting rods, this little pinwheel over here, on the side is our drag. So we turn it to the right, just like your hose faucet, righty tighty, lefty loosey. We go right, we're tightening the drag. So that means when you go to pull your line, when the bail is closed, so it shouldn't be letting line off, when you go to pull it, you should be able, your drag should be set to where just a little pressure like that, you can clean pull it. If you touch it and you can immediately pull it off, that's too light. Now, if you're having to work really hard to pull line, it's too tight. So you really just want to find it to where you adjust it just to where when you go to pull it with a little bit of tension, it's smooth, nice drag. You pull it right out. And that, along with your rod tip, when you're fighting the fish, that's what your rod is designed to do. So with these medium or medium heavy action rods, they're going to be pretty stout throughout the rod deck until you start to get up to like the top three or four eye guides. And then you're going to get that bent. And these rods are meant to take that force to take the tension off of the line so your line doesn't snap. So really the most important thing in fishing is your drag. If you're not using overkill, if you don't have a heavy action rod, 80 pound braid where you can just lock your drag because they're, they're not going to break your rod and they're not going to break your line. So what's the point of having the drag? Just fork the fish in. Um, but in all other cases, your drag's your best friend. So you go get that basic rod and reel combo, first fishing rod type. That's going to be perfect. I mean, you're going to be set up. Then all you need to do is go buy yourself a pack of like half ounce weights, 
whether that be, you know, little egg weights, casting weights, anything that you can put on the main line, pack of medium sized swivels, uh, barrel swivels, and uh, that's all you need. Then your pack of pack of hooks and your bait of choice and getting a cup of worms is great. Usually easy. They sell them at every Walmart. Uh, you're going to find them at um, Academy, you can find them at Cabela's, you can find them at local bait and tackle shops. So most places you see a gas station, you're driving up towards the lake, it says, you know, bait. That usually means they got a tub of minnows in there somewhere. So you could get, you know, a cup of minnows to take and fish with that. Uh, but they'll typically sell worms as well. So getting a hold of all of the elements that you need to be successful and get out to the water is as easy as it gets. Um, so you've got everything in your favor to help build that confidence up uh, in your fishing. And it may take you to new places in fishing that you didn't think you'd ever go um, or get to just because you went out there, you know, catching carp one day or catching drum and Hey man, this is easy. Like I can just sit here and, and catch these fish and, you know, that might lead you into, into trying a new species or trying a new type of fishing. But, um, you know, we just want you to be successful anytime, you know, we understand that not everybody's got 365 days a year to go fishing. You might only get a weekend or two a year. So you want to make the most of that time. Um, and in doing so, the easiest way to maximize that time, especially if you want to target your bigger non-game species, is looking for, you know, public access coves, nice clear water streams, marinas, places that you might, you know, pull your fifth wheel or RV or your tent and you go camping with the family and you're on the lake and you're typically most of those areas are around coves because you have sheltered water. Um, so nice, calm places those are great places to set up your lawn chair get a rod holder or just prop your rod up against your cooler or your chair um, and have at it and that's that's really what you're going to find the most success with if it if it is me you know i'm partial to a half ounce weight barrel swivel 10 to 14 pound monofilament test on a lot of my junker rods or reels that get old and outdated and i just save those for my uh for my non-game fishing because i know they can take a beating and get muddy and dirty and i don't have to worry about them um, and then just thick wire circle hooks or octopus hooks, bait holding hooks, anything that's thick wire is going to get the job done, keeping it in kind of a size one, size two, up to maybe size four, size six, even if you wanted to get real small, um, especially if you're fishing in like the clear water streams in the Eastern half of the state, you're targeting like river red horse or some of those sucker species, um, that are going to have the smaller mouths on them. So you are going to need little bit smaller hook but typically in those cases the fish is you know less than four pounds so you can get away with thin wire hooks with them um, little small treble hooks or like trout salmon egg hooks things that look like this real small size like 12 14 16 treble hooks and single point like salmon egg hooks but these little thin wires these will be perfect um, if you're using just a little piece of worm or grasshopper and you're fishing in your clear water creeks fishing them off the bottom using a smaller hook like that to catch those river suckers that on average are only going to be a pound to four pounds um, but when you are targeting you know your carp and drum and buffalo or at least having the expectation that that's what you might catch then you want to be electing for those thick wire hooks and but a couple worms is hard to beat you know you're, you can't go wrong throwing a piece of night crawler out there it's got scent it's got movement um, you get all these nice things for bait and most fish will eat a worm. They don't have much problem with it. Then you can get into, you know, the scented stuff, things that are going to put off a lot of scent and flavor into the water to attract those fish in. Um, I've had mixed results with the processed dough baits over the years. I've never found them to be so spectacular that that's all I would ever use. And I've certainly had days where I'm like, I'm not catching anything with these, but the worms are still picking up fish. So really hard to go wrong with the worms, but always be on the lookout for grasshoppers because grasshoppers are an underutilized bait and most fish species will eat grasshoppers and they, they actually quite enjoy them. You, you can outfish some other stuff by using a, a grasshopper. And if you're in the clear water creeks, you can fish them up off the bottom, but they're great to throw with a bobber, cast them out there into the kind of the seam line of the current. And just let that grasshopper middle of the water column and man, you'll catch bass, sunfish, catfish, 
all those non-game species that are willing to come take, especially if it's higher up in the water column, probably your drum come up and get it. But if it's down towards the bottom, you got a chance of catching all those other um, other species. Best way to hook a grasshopper right through the middle. Uh, you try to hook them so they're built in like three sections. So if you try to connect them where the head and the body meet, that's kind of a joint and you'll rip the head off. Uh, you can hook them right through the head, but the problem is, again, they can detach. So if a fish comes up and you're hooked through the head of the grasshopper, they'll pull the back half off and you'll just be left with the head. doesn't mean you won't catch something on that little head right there, but typically you just take that grasshopper. Most of your grasshoppers are going to be about that big. So they're going to be that perfect bait size profile, that two and a half inch and under, which is what we're really looking for with most fish species. Um, the smaller the baits are, the more success you have, the more opportunity you have to catch smaller fish but it doesn't eliminate being able to catch big fish so always sizing down um but yeah mid body just go right up underneath them and bring it right through their back so they just sit on that hook basically like wacky rigged you know they're just completely sideways on the hook point and then cast them out but in those clear water streams or on ponds or lakes fish them below a bobber um and then you know if you're really trying to target see if you can catch one of those specialty sucker fish or darters or shine just any of the cool little micro species that we've got around especially in those eastern clear water streams um then you might fish it off the bottom with some weight but typically just below a bobber uh, on a hook with maybe a piece of split shot a couple inches above the the hook on the line just so it'll pull that line out so you don't have any slack um but in the current usually doesn't matter but Always a good idea anytime you're fishing with a hook below a bobber to have some type of weight on the line in between your bobber and your hook, unless your hook is a jig head hook. So you can do that as well. Um, instead of using just a hook, if you wanted to use like a 16th ounce or an 8th ounce just jig head, that's going to work as your weight. So you can just use a basic, you know, cheap old ball jig head, put a worm or a grasshopper on it, and then put this below the bobber and then you don't need weight on the line because the weight is in the jig head. So that's an option as well that you can go with when you're fishing or if you're on those clear water streams, uh, no, we don't have any in here, but like a Ned head, the little Ned jig head. So it's like a mushroom top. They're flat and they're meant it, it's weighted. So they sit flat on the bottom and the hook is up. So those are good. You can toss a grasshopper or a worm out on that into like, the clear water streams and just slowly reel them in, drag them across the bottom, or you could just cast them out, let them fall down to the bottom and it'll stand up like this and use that as your weight. But those are, those are good options. So looks like we've, uh, we've run through the questions. Uh, appreciate everybody being here. Um, can't say it enough. We, we can't do these without you. Uh, we're not an appropriated agency, so we don't get any state tax dollars. We're completely funded by uh, hunting and fishing license sales and then the excise taxes that come off of hunting and fishing and marine fuel that you buy. So hunting and fishing equipment uh, goes into a big federal pot, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and then it's divvied up for states like ours to apply for grants. Um, and we just have to have 25% of the money for the project that we want to do. And that big pot of excise taxes funds the other 75% of a project. So we are a completely user pay, user benefit system here in Oklahoma. Um, the more people who participate, the more people who are interested, the more money that is available to do projects, habitat, boat ramps, um, fishing jetties, all the things that you know require lots of dollars for infrastructure. So we can't thank you enough for being interested in the sport and you know taking the time to get out there and enjoy the outdoors with the hobby like fishing. Um, that's what we're here for. So you ever have questions, you ever have, you know, want fishing tips, anything, call me, email me, text me. I will uh, either answer the question for you, or if I don't have the answer, I'll get you in contact with the person who can give you a better answer than I can. So we want you to be successful in the little bit of time that you get to enjoy out there on the water. So with that, if you can make it out fishing this weekend, it ought to be a good one. Um, we're right in that peak window for a lot of our game species, but white bass ought to be excellent, uh, this weekend anywhere outside. I mean, it should still be good in the Southeastern part of the state, but everywhere else outside of the Indian turnpike and I 40 corner down there, if you're West North or Northwest of that, this rain that we're getting, it's going to, we're going to get the white bass run 
right now. I mean, the rivers are already rising. Fish are going to be on the move for the next five to seven days, and then that'll be done with. But after we get through this little cold rain, probably by Sunday, Monday, you should start to see your lakes kind of come back around with your crappie and bass fishing. Um, but your non-game species, you know, they're going to be everywhere all the time. So you're going to get out and fish some bait off the bottom in a lake or a river this weekend. Can't go wrong. You're probably going to get into some drum and and some carp and some other non-game species. And, you know, if you're in the right place, right time, you might get into a whole mess of white bass. So best of luck out there. Stay safe. Uh, we will see you next time. And thanks for joining us today.